Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grace Point. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. If everyone would like to stand, I will start us off with some prayer. Dear Lord, uh, thank you that we can all gather here today. I know that being here in person is such a great experience to get closer to you and help us, even though we are further apart, um, to enjoy being together with you. Good morning, church. Welcome to worship. Uh, today, I want to give you some specific instructions on how we're going to greet each other. Uh, if you came in the same car, if you're from the same household, then that's between you and your family how you do that. But, you know, there are people who came here today. Maybe there's, they didn't come with anybody else, and I don't want them to feel like they're alone. And so we're going to keep our feet planted, and you're just going to kind of turn and wave and give a verbal greeting to those around you. If you're watching online, I encourage you right now, would you text somebody, uh, text them that you're praying for them, that you love them in the name of Jesus. Uh, let's greet each other, and let's worship our Jesus together. <laughs> You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. I invite you to join with us this morning and sing praises to our God.
and an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. You are my God and I will praise you.
love you because you loved us first. We love you because you loved us first. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. To rescue me from my sins. To rescue us from my sins. Amen. Amen. You are my Savior. The Lord, my name is Savior. We praise your name. You are my fountain, the son of righteousness, who comes with healing in his wings. You are the Christ, our sin bearer, our mediator, intercessor, and justifier. You supply every need. You are my soon and coming king. You are the blood of the everlasting covenant. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the one who restores, changes, transforms. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and dwell in our hearts, creating me a clean heart. Lord, renew a right spirit within me. Please do not take your Holy Spirit from our midst. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Forever we will give you praise. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Well, church, I want to invite you, if you would, to uh, take your Bible and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We'll be at verse 15 together in just a moment. Colossians chapter 1. I'll start reading in verse 15 in just a minute. As you're turning to Colossians 1.15, I, I want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know about Jesus? Do you have a saving knowledge of Jesus? I believe that an overwhelming majority, if not maybe 100% in this room today or watching today, you'd say, uh, yeah, I know Jesus. And I want you to think about that thought. Well, yeah, duh, I know Jesus. As I read this scripture, because I think the Lord wants to talk to us about what the original hearers possibly were thinking when they heard Paul's words. These are Paul's words to the church of Colossae. And it was first to them, but also for us as well. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 22. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth, and by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Verse 21, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's a lot of words. That's like a lot of scripture. Right? Why don't you just pick one or two of those? Why are we looking at all these together? Friend, I believe the Lord has a gift for you today, a gift for me today, in this passage of Scripture. It all has to do with 
We truly need to know our Jesus. Amen. I think it was the summer of the year of 2000, about 20 years ago, or I think exactly 20 years ago now, I was a youth pastor in Belton, Missouri, and we were going to have a bonfire for the youth group. And so as we were planning for the bonfire for this youth group, Fred was one of our adult youth staff, and he volunteered his place to to hold the bonfire, and he said, Brady, I'm not going to be able to be there when it starts. I'll be there about an hour later, but you go ahead and get it started for me, and Hills were talk to all the fifth graders in that state, and, and here I am in the Missouri state, I, I guess they, they, I don't know, they didn't know what they're talking about. I know how to start a fire. And, and then he started to tell me, you know, there'll, there'll be a, a can of diesel fuel if you need a little bit of that to get it started. It's at the garage, and, and then I have all it set up for you. You won't be able to miss it. And I just stopped listening because I knew that I was going to be the one starting the fire. No one else was going to be in danger, and I know exactly what I'm doing. So I get there to Fred's property before anybody else, and sure enough, I find the can of diesel fuel there at the garage, and, and I look back to the back of this property, and I think, well, that must be it. I see this big pile of wood, and you know how farmers do. They collect branches and limbs and all kinds of scrap wood, and they put it together in a big pile, and I thought, well, this is great. He's provided this for us. It was about 15 feet tall, about 25 feet long, and about 10 to 15 feet wide, and and I like a bonfire, I thought this is going to be pretty good. So I, I took this, and no one else was there yet, and so I took this can of diesel fuel, and I thought, well, you know, you've got to put some over every part of it, and so I, I just put a little bit over each, but it took a lot, it was 25 feet long, about 10 feet, or 15 feet high, about 10 to 15 feet wide, and I got the diesel fuel on it. By this time, students were starting to show up, and I'm ready to light this, this bonfire. This is going to turn out to be a really good night. And so I, I throw a match, and sure enough, it lit and what you thought would happen, happened. It went up big, and, and, and yet what I didn't anticipate was what was going to happen next. Some students were bringing some of those, you know, those white tables we have a little bit lighter than the, the heavy wooden ones, and we were going to have s'mores put out, the makings for s'mores on that. And, and so they set up the tables, but you couldn't get very close to the fire. It melted the table. The table became the s'more. It was starting to melt right before us. And nobody could roast hot dogs or, or roast s'mores because you couldn't be very close to it. You'd get burned. And we had to stand back. And at this moment, I realized I didn't listen to Fred. I knew how to make a fire. I've made many fires before, but I didn't pay attention to what he was saying. At that moment, Fred shows up about an hour late. We have this huge blazing bonfire. And he says, Brady, what are you doing? I said, I followed your instructions. He says, no, no, you burnt my entire wood pile down. Over here, look. And the part I didn't see is he had a smaller amount of wood, an appropriate amount, but that's what I was supposed to light for the bonfire. The fire trucks did come. It didn't spread like they thought it would. Nobody was hurt. But to this day, I don't think any of those students remember anything about that bonfire other than their crazy youth pastor setting the whole thing ablaze. I didn't spend any time really connecting with the students. I was trying to keep them away from this big hazardous thing that I had created. I think about that because as we look at this scripture in Colossians 1, 15 through 22, it ties right in with where we were last week. Remember last week we saw in Colossians uh, 1, 9, where Paul is praying for the church of Colossae, and he says, May God fill you with the knowledge of his will. These were people who knew who Jesus was. These were people who loved the Spirit. Verse 7 says they loved the Spirit of God, and yet he knew he prayed continually, persistently, powerfully for them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will that could only come through spiritual wisdom and understanding. The Holy Spirit had to do it. And then he gives this chunk of Scripture we just read. Why would Paul give such basic information about Jesus to these people who loved Jesus? Friend, just like last week, sometimes we're tempted to think, do I know Jesus? Yeah, I know Jesus. What do you think I'm here for? Do I know Jesus? Well, why do you think I logged on to the online service? Yeah, I know Jesus, of course. I mean, shouldn't this be for someone else who has no idea who Jesus is? And friend, if you're here today or if you're watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to welcome you. You're in the right place. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us. You stay as long as you would like and just taste and see how good God is. But today's message is really for the believer. It's for the Christian. It's for the one who says, yeah, I already know that. But just like Paul was talking to Colossae, I believe the Lord is speaking to us today. Right. Brady, Grace Point family, you need to know me. What next? 
not only to be filled with the knowledge of God's will for us, but to truly know me. Amen. So I want us to walk through some scripture together, but I, I love what J.D. Greer writes about some of his misunderstanding about Jesus. Pastor J.D. Greer writes these words, For many years my relationship with God felt distant, cold almost. I knew a lot of truths about God, and I was trying to do the things he commanded, but it always seemed to be from a distance. He seemed kind of like a busy teacher who had given an assignment and then stepped out of the room, leaving us students to get it done. I knew he was coming back, so I was busy with the assignment, but how do you love, how do you feel close to someone like that? To really love Jesus, you must know this Jesus. Amen. You'll never grow as a Christian until you develop a personal intimacy with the Lord Jesus, until you deal with him as you would a best friend. Turn to him first in every need. Consult him at every step. Talk to him about your difficulties. Spread before him all your sorrows. Allow him to share in all your joys. Do all things as in his sight. To go through every day leaning on him. Yes. Friend, I believe the Lord wants to encourage us today to draw us in today with something that we may be tempted to say, I know that. I know who Jesus is. I know about Jesus. Don't you have anything else, Pastor Brady? Can't we talk about something else? And I believe the very Spirit of God says, look, look, I need to fill you with the knowledge of my will for you, for your family, for your church, for your individual lives. But you must be centered in on who this Jesus is. We need the Holy Spirit to transform sound doctrine into dynamic relationship with Jesus. Amen. We need to allow him to help us listen to his voice in the scriptures that we read in the Bible. Yes. It's more than just reading your Bible or knowing your Bible, but it's listening to the voice of God who has breathed that scripture into existence. So let's, let's look back at the, the text again as we look at verse 15. We see Paul giving us this first key thought about who Jesus is to people who would have said, I already know, I already know this stuff. Jesus reveals the Father. The only way to know God is through Jesus. I love this in Josh's testimony. He just shared about when Jesus became more than a name to him as he sat right over here on that Easter and God revealed himself to Josh. You know, that's the only way you'll know God is through Jesus. He's the one who reveals the Father to us. God is invisible. He is spirit. Human eyes cannot see him. So how can he be known? How can he be perceived? Jesus is the image of God. Right. You say, well, wait a minute. Isn't man made in the image of God? Yes, but Paul is talking about something different here. To say that you and I are made in the image of God means that there are some things in the way he's created us that resemble his characteristics. Maybe in the personality or, or a rational way of thinking or our ability to relate to another. But Jesus is the exact representation of God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint. All that God is, Jesus is. Right. If Jesus were not fully God, he wouldn't be the exact representation of him. We may be made in the image of God, but Jesus is the image of God. How are you going to know God? Not by reason, not by religion, not by ritual, but by revelation through Jesus Christ. Jesus has come to reveal God to you and me. We can never fully know God apart from the Son. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. My Father has entrusted everything to me, Jesus says. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Another thing that Paul puts out here before the Church of Colossae, that I believe the Holy Spirit is putting out before us today, to truly know our Jesus, we need to see that Jesus is the power of creation. Every good thing was made by Him. Every good thing He made. 
John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. In the beginning, the Word already existed. That's Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. Now, now what is He talking about? It's talking about the one who rules the universe. Not only the one that holds the whole world in his hands, but the one who has the past and the present and holds the future in his hands as well. In fact, when you find yourself asking the question, what is going on in this world around me? It seems like everything is falling apart. What is this world coming to, friend? This entire world is coming to Jesus. Right. Whether they acknowledge it or not, the day is coming where every knee will bow and every yes. tongue will confess Amen. that Jesus is Lord. Right. I know about Jesus. We know Jesus. I don't believe the Lord is calling me to get you to doubt your salvation today or to get you to doubt the truth you know about Jesus. But I believe he's saying, do you want to know more? Right. Do you want to press into me more? Or are you just satisfied because you've been there, you've done that, and, and you're really going to go do it on your own? Is it like the teacher who's given an assignment, who's left the class, and you're going to take care of it, and the teacher's going to return, and you're going to get great marks? Or are you saying, Jesus, are you really the power of creation that everything has been made through you? Are you really the one that is with me now? A third thought that Paul brings out in this passage Jesus is not only the power of creation, Jesus is the preserver of creation. Everything is held together by him. Amen. Jesus is the glue of the galaxies. What keeps everything from falling apart? Jesus. Amen. The one who feeds the sun with fuel. Jesus is the one who guides the planets in their orbit around the sun. Jesus is the one who set all the stars in their place. You can talk about natural laws or the laws of the universe, but friend, every one of these planets, every one of these entities are obeying the command of our Jesus. Friend, not only will the universe fall apart, apart from Jesus, but our lives crumble apart from Jesus. Right. If we don't allow him and acknowledge that he really is the center, just like the S U. In, the S-O-N, Son of God, must be the center of everything. And before we're ready to say, I know, I know, I know, we could miss it, and we could miss some very important truths that Paul is crying out to the church of Colossae. I know you love God. I know you love the Spirit. But you need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will for you. And the very next thing he says is, let's go back to Jesus. Jesus is everything. You need to be focused on Fourth, Jesus is the purpose of creation. Everything is for him. Look at verse 16 of Colossians chapter 1. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realm and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Why does this world exist? Why do you have breath in your lungs? Why are we alive here today? We're sometimes tempted to think everything that's created is for me. He said, well, it's for you. Okay, fine. It's for us. We'll split the difference. It's for us. God didn't create all this for us. It's been created for Jesus. Yeah, right. This right size our understanding of who he is and who we are. And friend, when we begin to live life, even try to do ministry, thinking that everything is created for us, we miss out on who this Jesus right. is. Do we really know this Jesus? Right. The one who all creation finds its purpose in. See, it's all headed by Jesus. It's all for Jesus. The key to all the mystery of all of history is in Jesus Christ himself. Amen. The final thought we see in the scripture is this. Jesus reconciles the fallen. Yep. Only hope can be found in Jesus. Colossians 1.20 And through him... 
God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Has any other king, has any other government, has any other authority come even close to making good on claims like this? Friend, we are criminals. He was the one who paid our debt. Not only did he come to rescue us, but he paid the debt for our sin. And he did it himself. He didn't outsource this reconciliation. He didn't outsource it to someone or something else. He said, I am the one who will reconcile all things to me. Psalm 130, verse 4 and 5. But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I'm counting on the Lord, the psalmist says. Yes, I'm counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. Friend, why did God save you? That you and I might fear him. Now some of this trips us up when we think of this word fear. We get the wrong concept of, of fear. But it's, it's more like you would have a, a fear or respect for the son, the S-U-N. <clears throat> the S-U-N, son, is necessary for life. You don't want to be in wrong relation to the sun. You don't want to be on the, the wrong side of the sun. Apart from the S-U-N, life ends in a cold, miserable, very quick death. But in right relationship to the S-U-N sun, there is health, there is warmth that comes necessary for life. And Paul is saying it in this way, that, that he, Jesus, might be preeminent. And then watch how Paul makes this personal. Look at verse 21 and 22. This includes you, Paul said. This includes you who were once far away from God. I believe God is reminding the church, you need me. Don't just point your fingers at the world who hasn't found me yet. Those who, like verse 7 says, love the Spirit of God. We desperately need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will for us. And then, just like Paul is leading the church of Colossae, we need to be reminded of how important Jesus is. Yes. I know. I know. I don't need to listen to that. I've had training in that. I've taught classes in that. I've experienced that, and before you know it, we're finding ourselves with a bonfire out of control, wondering why we can't hold things together, and our Heavenly Father says, did you not listen to me? You can be caught up in doing all kinds of things that look like what you're supposed to be doing, but you miss the very truth. Listen, he says, it's about your King Jesus. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. When we truly see who Jesus is, being in his presence should cause our heart to melt in joy and gratitude. Yes. Yes. Not boredom, not what have you done for me lately. That's a heart that's not really seen their Jesus. Mm. So what do we do with all this? What might the Lord want to say to us today? I think these are some points of application the Lord may have for you today. It's sure application for me. First is this. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Are you serious? Like... I braved through all the social distancing to hear that today. Can't you give me something else? I already knew about Jesus. Can't you give me some deep, dark secret from the Old Testament I've never heard before? And I believe God is saying, hey, study all of my word. All of it's true. I don't need to put down the Old Testament. But the Old Testament, the New Testament, it's all pointing to Jesus. Right. It's not about religion. It's not about law. It's about being in relationship with him. Yeah, and Jesus is saying now, when, when life is giving you all kinds of litmus tests of what you really hunger for, what you crave. He's saying, it's all about me. Yes. You see, to love him, we must know him. Yes. Paul is telling the church of Colossae, I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us today, hey, get close, Christian. Get close, follower of Jesus. And let's get fixated on who he is again. To truly know him, we will love him more than anything else. Yes. I have a friend that we were sharing of what the Lord was doing in our lives, and I was talking to him over some social media, and he shared what the Lord was putting in his heart. And it was for his people in another state. 
He said, you know, Brady, I'm, I'm sensing Jesus remind me that the, the Sunday morning Christian, we're experiencing the death of the Sunday morning Christian. Right. In the absence of being able to gather, it doesn't take very many weeks for that type of faith to die. He says, but I feel like the Lord is, is kind of reviving in me that this may not be a bad thing. Not in a cold heartedness towards any person, but to say there is a reviving or coming to life of a seven day a week faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. A faith in Jesus Christ that's not limited to one location or one campus or just one gathering of people, but to say, Jesus, I want to be filled with the knowledge of your will for my life. And I want to be fixated on who you are, Amen. not just at 9 a.m. or at 1045 a.m., yes. but every day of the week. I believe Jesus is inviting us to see him as preeminent, supreme, surpassing all others. First and foremost, in our church, in our family, in our daily lives. Well, yeah, that's, that's assumed. But what next? I believe Paul says, no, 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 <laughs> you didn't hear me. I've been passionately praying, Paul says, for you. That you would be so filled with the knowledge of God's will. When you and I are filled with the knowledge of God's will, there's no room for anything else. Right. And we are so fixed on Jesus. He says, Jesus is supreme. And you know what happens? I begin to understand his scripture. Where he says, I will build my church. Those are Jesus' words. But he commands me to love my wife the way he loved the church. He commands me to love my neighbor as myself. And as we love one another with the love of Jesus, he, in the preeminent, supreme, above all other position at church, at home, at work, in our daily lives, he says, I am ready to pour out my spirit upon you. Church, I want to thank you for your attention to God's word today. I can see in your eyes your strong attention to the word of God today. And I don't just thank you for me, but I... I'm thankful that your heart is soaking up Jesus' words in Scripture. Those who are watching with us online, by faith, I thank you for pressing in and listening to God's word. I'm confident for you, for us, that God did not design this time to be a bookend. We heard a little nugget of truth from Colossians 1, 15 through 22, and, and that's it. But I see it more as an on-ramp where the Lord wants to start something and, and do even more work throughout this day and this week. So I challenge you to take some time and let the Holy Spirit continue to speak to you through His Word. Just before we, we pray and we are dismissed together, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to give of His tithes and our offerings and faith promise gifts for missions. Just before we do, I want to thank you, church. Uh, I've been blessed to see what God is doing through your obedience to him. I've seen people this week who have been fed, physically fed, physical food because of your generosity and your obedience to Jesus. This week I've been in meetings and I'm excited to see how God is releasing kingdom dollars into other avenues of ministry outside this campus, other gatherings outside this campus that in no way can bring glory to Grace Point, but only glory to Jesus. And God's doing it through your obedience and through your faithfulness to him. I've heard from one of our missionaries this week thanking us, really thanking God, where they thought they should plan for a downturn in some of the funding in their account. They saw that it was double what they thought it would be. And it's coming out of faithfulness that you have to your Jesus in obedience to your Jesus. And so as, as we give today, as you exit the building, you'll find offering buckets. Uh, we're not passing the plate uh, during these times like this, but you can give uh, of your offering as you exit in those buckets. If you would like to give online or on the app that's still available to you at www.gpnaz.org, you'll also find the uh, Grace Point Nazarene app there at the uh, Google Play Store or the iTunes Store if you'd like to give that way. But church, would you stand with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me so much that you tell me what I need to hear, not just what I want to hear. Lord, I thank you that you are so patient with me that when you've tried to tell me once and, and you need to tell me again and again, Lord, I thank you that you keep 
taking me back to the foundational truths in you. And Lord, I, I thank you that you don't just love me that way. You love my brothers and sisters here today. And, and Lord, together, we are grateful for how you are directing our attention on you, King Jesus. And so, Lord, you're not our plan B, plan C, D, E, or F. You are everything. And so, Lord, we exalt you as preeminent, supreme, above all other. You are the one whom all creation sings praise to. And, Lord, thank you for inviting us into that. Lord, I ask that you would help me and my friends today to pray the hundred-year prayers. Not that it's wrong or inappropriate to bring to you the cares of our heart, the things that where our body hurts, where we need provision. Lord, you tell us to do that. But Lord, all those things will pass away in a matter of years. But Lord, would you help us cry out to you today for the things that a hundred years from now, when we're dead and gone, when we're with you in eternity, that will still be bearing fruit. Lord, would you fill us with the knowledge of your will? Would you keep our eyes fixed on you? Thank you, Lord, for the obedience and giving today. My friends online and those here in person, Lord, we, we acknowledge everything we have is yours. And as we give back to you, portions of, of what you've entrusted to us. Would you help us reach as many people as we possibly can with your good news? In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Church, thank you for worshiping with us today. As you go, I want to remind you, if you would, out of love for your neighbor, observe the six-foot rule. Uh, but, in all seriousness, would you prayerfully ask the Lord how you can speak a word of encouragement right now? Like, in the next 60 seconds or 10 minutes, whatever you choose, as you're leaving to talk to somebody, I believe the Lord may want to speak through you to another friend a word of encouragement. Uh, those who are at home, uh, those who are watching online, that you can do that through text. Would you prayerfully consider who the Lord would call you to encourage today? Send in a text in Jesus' name uh, and point to them to your Lord. God bless you. You're